we continue our look at the book of Jonah. It's a tiny little book. If you were here last week, hopefully you put a bookmark there so that you can find it easily, more easily this week. But if you're uh, just with us, uh, Jonah is one of the Old Testament prophets. It is just four chapters long, just usually a couple of pages in your Bible. So if you need to use the table of contents, that's okay. Uh, open up with me, though, to the second chapter of Jonah. And this is one of those cases where over the four weeks, we're going to read every single verse in the book out loud. Uh, so stick with me today uh, as we read Jonah. We're actually going to back up one verse, pick up the very end of chapter 1, verse 17, and read all the way through the end of chapter 2. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed this to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains, I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah on dry land. If that verse doesn't make you smile, get with it. You got to pay attention a little bit. We have fish vomit in the sermon today. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you have given us a holy book, a wonderful book, but a book that speaks to real life. Lord, our lives are filled with waters that overwhelm us and the mess of our own making. And Lord, sometimes you save us in the, most, in the strangest of ways but we thank you for that salvation. So Lord, we pray today as we study your word together that the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer, amen. In life, sometimes to really get clarity, we need a change of perspective, don't we? Just in the hustle and bustle of everyday life, we can kind of lose track with where we are and what we are doing. And sometimes if just looking at life from a different angle can help us get our bearings in a way that sets us on the proper course. Uh, one of the things that I, I really love about flying, I don't fly a lot, but occasionally we'll fly, is just when you're coming in, I especially love landing back here in Houston because Sometimes, you know, they've got to burn off a little fuel or maybe it's not quite their turn to land yet and they'll start circling the city. And when they do that, I love to look out the window, uh, try to figure out where we are in this great big city uh, of Houston, Texas. And, and really, I love it when they circle around, especially if I'm flying into Hobby, they might come around our side of town. I love being able to look out the window and figure out, well, there's, there's Highway 59 and, and there's uh, uh, the, the Beltway. And so if I look right over here, that's getting pretty close to Sugar Land and kind of make things out. And what's amazing when you do that is the things that we often think are far away from each other, up there circling the city, they just don't look that far apart helps to reorient me towards where I am kind of in this great metropolis. And really, as I'm driving around, sometimes helps me know my way, even if the GPS uh, is pointing me in a different direction, because you've seen it from a different point of view. Now, while I have gone up like that, I've never actually gone down like Jonah. And yet I imagine that sinking feeling he had as he was sinking below the waves and watching the world above him disappear into the distance, that has to be a change of perspective that gets your attention as well. 
I haven't ever done scuba diving, done a little bit of snorkeling where they take you out in the water and drop you off. And sometimes we've been in a place where uh, one time off the coast of Costa Rica, this was a long time ago before we had kids, uh, we, we had gone down there and they drop us off and it looked like it was only about 10 feet deep. If you've ever been in a place where the water's so clear like that, it can be deceptive. Because when I jumped off the boat and was underneath the water, I could tell it was about 40 feet deep. And I love to swim and I love to fish, so I would take a deep breath. Allison is not this. She, they dropped us off and said, you can swim over to that island if you want. And she and a bunch of other people, they just immediately did that. She does not like the perspective from below, but I would take a big, big breath. We had some flippers on and I would swim down as deep as I could go. The fish swimming around me look up. It really is a different perspective to think. All that we think is really the surface. We even talk about that, don't we? Like ground level. It's where we think all of life happens, right here on the ground. But when you swim down and look back up, you realize where we live our daily lives isn't where all of life happens. God has made this world where much happens above us. And if we ever have the luxury of going down into the ocean for pleasure, not like Jonah, we can tell there's a lot of life down below. Well, sinking there in the ocean did change Jonah's perspective. Up to this point, we know that Jonah has been running away from God. In fact, he's been trying to go down, just he didn't know that he wanted to go this low because God had told him to go and preach to the city of Nineveh. If you weren't here last week, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. They were the worst of the worst. These were bad people. They did bad things. And God had commanded uh, Jonah to go and preach to that city a word against the city, which you think a prophet would love to do. But Jonah, for a lot of reasons, had an inkling that God would not be sending him to Nineveh to preach this message unless God was open to forgiving the Ninevites. And Jonah did not like that assignment. We see throughout the text, he did not want the Ninevites to get a chance to repent. Sort of like when you're driving on these freeways, you're down below, not up above looking, and someone rushes past you, and you know there's a speed trap up ahead. You could warn them by flashing your lights, but do you do that? No, because there's some people in this life, you just want to see them get their comeuppance. And that's what Jonah thought about the Ninevites. So this idea that God had told him, go, go and preach to the Ninevites, he actually went in the opposite direction. We're told he went down to the city of Joppa. The, the book uses that word down over and over again. He goes down to the city of Joppa. He buys a ticket to Tarshish, which is on the other side of the sea. He gets on a boat. And even when God attempts to get his attention there with the storm, he goes down into the, to the, the, the bottom of the boat trying to get away from God. And he so much wants to get away from God that even in the midst of the storm, his solution is not to go back and obey God's commandments but to have the sailors hurl him into the sea. That's where we left him last week. And at the beginning of this week, we have Jonah going down once more, but down to the depths of the sea. In fact, he makes it all the way down to rock bottom. Look with me again at verses five and six. As he describes in his own words what was happening to him, he says, the engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth barred me beneath me, barred me in forever. This is a picture of him sinking to the very depths of the earth. He's not just in the ocean. He is at the bottom of the ocean and the deep surrounded him. It was like he was in a prison cell. The water had, had covered him over. Uh, the language he uses is language that the Bible uses uh, really throughout the Old Testament to describe what we would call hell, what the Old Testament calls Sheol, the place of the dead. It's where people went when they died. In, in the ancient Hebrews understanding uh, of the world, uh, they understood it either be to be beneath the ocean itself uh, or, or somewhere. Uh, they use that language of the depth or the pit uh, to speak of, of the place where the dead go. And Jonah says he was going there. He, it's like he was on his way to the pit and he was knocking on its door. Talk about a change of perspective. It sometimes happens to us when we get where we thought we wanted to go only once we got there, 
it didn't turn out to be all that we hoped it would be. Jonah is trying to get away from God's presence. That's why he's gone down to Joppa. That's why he went down in the boat. It's now why he's going down into the sea. If you'd asked Jonah what he wanted and he had any kind of honest answer at all, he would have said, I want to get away from God. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands this morning if you've ever had such a thought, if you ever wanted to get away from God. You, you may not have even ever articulated that in your own life, but every time we sin, friends, that is us saying in the depths of our soul, what I really want in this life is to go my own way. I know all the things that God wants me to do, but the heart of sin is saying, I, I, at least for a little while, I want to do something different. And maybe in life, because we know that righteousness is not the easiest thing. Can I get an amen from all the kids who've ever struggled to keep the rules? Is it easy to follow the rules? No, is it easy to always do what's right? When your brother or sister comes and picks on you and you know the correct thing to do is to love them in return, is that always easy to do? No, we know that being good runs against the grain of our nature. And if your parents are saying amen, just tell them you aren't always good either, mom and dad. We want life without God. It's entertaining to us. Uh, it, it's tempting to us that we think if I could just get away from God for a little while, I would be able to do all the things that I wanted to do. It's the height of really temptation in almost any relationship. Relationships by their very nature are constraining, aren't they? The very fact that we enter into a relationship with a spouse or we enter into a relationship with family members, it means we are committed to one another in ways that really limit what we can do in life. Uh, the, the very nature of that is limiting. So we may have these fleeting thoughts that said, you know how I could really have some fun in life would be if I could get away from the relationships that bind me. But Jonah discovered when we get away from the relationships, especially the most important relationship in our life, it's not fun and adventure that we find, but our own destruction. I imagine as a prophet, it wasn't always fun in Israel. I imagine as he was trying to get to Tarshish, he thought, you know what I'm gonna do when I get there? I'm gonna sit on a beach. I'm not gonna go to Sabbath worship. They don't even have that there. I'm gonna get me one of those little drinks with the umbrella and I am going to relax. No more of God telling me what to do. And yet what did he find when he found life without God? Really the despair of his own soul. That once he realized he had life without God's care, once he realized he had life without God's presence, he found it to be a jail cell that barred him from life itself. And this passage teaches us that as he was sinking down, he realized that he would never see the things that he loved again. It's interesting that, that verse uh, uh, here uh, where he talks about the, the temple, uh, verse 4, he says, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again to your holy temple. The NIV puts that as a positive, yet I will look again to the temple. Many other translations see that really as a negative where he says, I've been banished from your sight and I will never see the temple again. The Hebrew is, is difficult to interpret. Uh, it, we do think though, when he's sinking down, he has the realization, I am going to die. I will never see the places that I love again. Namely, I will never see the temple, I will never worship the Lord. What he realizes is the thing he was most trying to get away from, God himself is that which he loves the most. That's how it is a lot of times in our life, isn't it? That when we try to get away from our obligations, when we try to get away from our relationships, we discover only too late that what we have left is actually what we love the most. And here Jonah realizes that, and in the depths, he cries out. Now, I don't know what a cry sounds like in the depths of the ocean, but my guess is it's a little garbled. It's probably a pitiful cry, probably a cry that barely had any kind of uh, words at all, just a cry from his spirit to the Lord's, Lord, help me. Lord, show me mercy. It speaks to how difficult it is to ask for help, that Jonah had to be at the depths of of the ocean before he called out to God for help. All of us have experienced that in our life a time or two where we knew we should 
ask for help, where we knew we should listen to the Lord's heeding, where we knew we should reach out to someone else to step into our life and help us follow the Lord more faithfully. And yet how often do we have to learn the hard way? A few months ago, I mentioned that I had had a spill at my house. Uh, I was doing a project that I should have asked for help in. I was decking a portion of my attic and I was up there and I had placed a piece of plywood above the rafters and, and God had given me some guidance in that moment. I heard a still small voice in my head that said, you should put a safety screw in this plywood. Temporary, I wasn't gonna leave that plywood there, but God had said, uh, in hindsight, I'm pretty sure it was the Holy Spirit saying, you should put a safety screw in this. But you know what I did? I did not listen to the still, small voice. And just as we talked about last week, God gives us warnings along the way. There were near missteps in which I should have heard the still, small voice once more. You should put a safety screw in this plywood. But I did not. It was only after I had taken a misstep that I could not catch myself, had gone flying across the attic and caught one of the rafters across my ribs. I've broken ribs before, and as soon as I hit, I knew I've probably broken a rib again. You can ask Allison, for weeks I had a black stripe, the shape of that rafter across my ribs. And do you know what I did when I finally got over the pain enough to sit up and get straight, I put a safety screw <laughs> in the plywood. It's hard to ask for help. Jonah's testimony means this. When we do, it doesn't matter how far down we have gone it doesn't matter how pitiful our cry. It doesn't matter how embarrassed we are that we didn't ask for help before this point. It doesn't matter if we feel shame over the fact that we should have known better, but we did not. It doesn't matter how much of a mess that we have made, no matter how pitiful our cry for help, if we, with our last breath, call out to God to save, he does. He does. This is the testimony of Jonah's song. I love the image here. You know, his prayer, the first prayer that he called out to God, it had to have been a pitiful prayer. It had to be a garbled prayer. It had to be a prayer that were just bubbles trickling up before he died. And yet God answered that prayer. Now that he's inside the fish and he has some time to reflect, he's written this song. It's a better prayer. He's like, Lord, that was a pitiful prayer. Let me write a better prayer. And you gotta get the picture. I mean, this whole story is just wonderful, isn't it? That I imagine by this time, maybe the whale has made its way back Back to the surface, not a whale fish, I know, but we call it the whale. Uh, so it's made its way back up, and, and there, could you imagine, you're, you're out there, you're in a different boat, you're on a, on, a, on a whale watching cruise out there, and this whale comes by, and you hear a guy singing the song inside, uh, you know, love lifted me right out of the spout. This is the picture of Jonah. And in this prayer, what he is giving God thanksgiving for is that when we mess up everything, God is still gracious to us. It's not just to petulant prophets. One of the reasons God is saving Jonah is because he still has a heart for the Ninevites. That's how this story started, that God is such a God of grace that he saves both petulant prophets and the wicked, the most wicked of the wicked, the Ninevites. That is who he is. Jonah calls out to God for help. Now, help comes in a strange way, right? Help comes in the form of this fish. The fish comes and it swallows Jonah. Now, lots of ink has been spilled uh, over the fact of could somebody live in a fish for three days? All of that. You have lots of scholars who say, well, this is maybe a parable that, that is written there. I just want you to know wherever you stand on all those issues, here's the thing. A God who can raise somebody from the dead can keep somebody alive in a fish, right? Right? And also, just in a sense, if you're like, well, I just don't think this happened as a parable, here's the thing too. God uses some of the strangest stories in the world to teach us the deepest truths, pun intended today. And it's this. God will go to any length to save those 
he loves. That's the whole point of this story was the storm wasn't judgment. It was an attempt at salvation. It was an attempt to correct Jonah's course. The pagan sailors come to Jonah and saying, what have you done? Uh, that wasn't a God uh, judgment. That was God's salvation. Even throwing him into the sea is to get Jonah to the point where he recognizes that even though he thinks he wants life without God, life without God is absolute Hell, that is the literal definition of hell. It is life without God. It's where God gives sinners exactly what they think they want, life without him. But when Jonah came face to face to that reality, he uttered his, with his last breath a prayer for salvation. And because God is so gracious, he saved him. He didn't immediately transport him back to life before, did he? He put him in the belly of a fish. Now, I like fish but I don't think the inside of a fish would actually be that pleasant of a place. And here Jonah is for three days and three nights, allowing him to contemplate his predicament, humble his heart, and return to the Lord, which teaches us something about repentance, doesn't it? I've known a lot of people who they get themselves in a royal mess and they think they are at rock bottom. They come into my office, that's what happens. The pastor's office is where you come when you're in at rock bottom. You don't have to wait till that moment. I want you to know, you can come before you get to that moment and we can talk. But it, lots of folks have come to me at that point in their life and they repent, but then they become angry with God that things don't go immediately back to the way they went before, they were before. But genuine repentance is recognizing that sometimes we make certain kinds of mistakes that for a manner of reasons, God is not going to immediately rescue us from. Because often what we need rescuing from is not just the circumstances, not just the mess that we have made, but the posture of life that got us in that mess in the first place. If he immediately rescues Jonah and sits him back to Nineveh, gives him a course correction, uh, just like that, uh, we're, we're going to learn this in, next week that Jonah, he's actually not a very good student. He's going to struggle to get the message even after the fish. Uh, but at least he has three days in a fish in the ocean to think about what he's done and to contemplate charting a new course. It says for you and me, when I've made a mess of my life and when I've repented and things remain difficult, that part of my posture in those difficulties is to remember I am in need of God. I'm in need of his guidance. I am in need of his care so that we walk in life in such a way that we do learn from our mistakes. I wonder in your life right now what might be that fish smell for you. What in your life is happening in such a way that it's a reminder of perhaps mistakes that you've made in the past. It's not meant to be there to shame us. It's not meant to be there to cause us uh, ongoing grief, but might those moments call us to renewed sense of dependence upon God. In our own church's life, we know that there are difficulties and challenges. And when we feel such things, I wonder if in a hard moment, we, like Jonah, might craft our own prayer. Craft a prayer that reflects not on other people's sins. That's just too easy, isn't it? But reflects on our own sinfulness, on the, our own ways, the ways that we fall short of God's glory. Might we use it as an opportunity to ask God for his help once more. Jonah reminds us, no matter where we are, God hears our prayer. I love how he says it. He says, look, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. If you ask anybody what the miracle is in the book of Jonah, what will they tell you? Oh, it's the fish. The miracle is the fish. God swallowed uh, Jonah with that big fish and kept him alive for three days. And that is a marvelous miracle. But if you paid attention to us reading the chapter, do you know how little the fish actually shows up in the story? That big, great fish only shows up in two verses. Jonah doesn't even mention him in his prayer. He swallows him, and then what does he do? Spits him out. The fish is really the minor character in the story. 
the main character is God and his love for us. Being swallowed by fish is really a small miracle. A greater miracle is that God forgives us of our sins time and time again. So I wonder, wherever you are today, God may be calling. <laughs> with warning signs, with troubles. You may, you may think, well, Pastor, I'm, I've got so many troubles in my life. Maybe they aren't judgment. Maybe they're salvation. Maybe they're God trying to get your attention. Call on me, for I am willing and ready to save. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we thank you for this marvelous, wonderful part of Scripture. Lord, we all know what it's like to try to run away from you. To know what it's like to try to run away from responsibilities, to, to run away from calling, to run away really from paths of righteousness because, Lord, in our, in our worst moments, we think that there's going to be a better life wherever you aren't. And yet, Lord, when we find ourselves in those places, we discover that we are in a jail of our own making, that, Lord, the joy of our life is robbed from us. Lord, life itself ebbs away so that we find ourselves overwhelmed by the darkness. Lord, we trust that the darkness is not dark to you, that no matter where we've run to, no matter how far we've sunk, that if we simply call out to you for help, you are ready and willing to save. We're so grateful for the miracle that you place in each one of our lives. Lord, not with big fish, but with an even greater love, a love that forgives all of our sins and makes us clean. So Lord, help us to be a people who, unlike Jonah, are quick to call on you when we need that grace and love. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.